the November, excuse me, the November 5th uh, work session of the Williamsburg City Council will come to order. Ms. Burcham, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Maslin. Here. Ms. Ramsey. Here. Mayor Freiling. Here. Vice Mayor Pons. Here. Mr. Zhang. Here. Next on the agenda, we have items for City Council meeting of November 8th, 2018. And the first of those is Council Preview. Mr. Trivet, anything you'd like to highlight? You know, it's a pretty full agenda for Thursday. We have a whole host of public hearings, uh, the most notable of which is an outdoor special events um, text amendment for the Museum Support District and a corresponding approval of the special use permit for that. Um, and then we have some unfinished business, which includes an offshore drilling resolution and uh, presentation or adoption of the 2019-2020 goals, initiatives, and outcomes. Um, and then under new business, we have consideration and approval of the PPTA interim agreement for the Monticello redesign. Any questions for Mr. Trivet? No, sir. Uh, this takes us to the public comment section of our meeting. If anybody would like to address council on anything that we will be uh, dealing with at our Thursday meeting, uh, you're welcome to come forward. Uh, or if you'd like to comment on any topic, we'd be happy to hear it. If you could come up and state your name and address and limit your remarks to five minutes, we would appreciate that. Seeing no one come forward, we will move on to background presentations and discussions. The first of which is a presentation concerning the 2019-20 Goals, Initiatives, and Outcomes Development. Mr. Trivet. Yes. Thank you, Mayor. Good to go here. Um, it, as you know, we're nearing the end of our goals, initiatives, and outcomes process, which is our biennial strategic planning process. And uh, so today what we'd like to do is present to you the draft of the um, GIOs that we have to this point, which includes a whole host of public comment, of course, the input from the city council and the staff at the retreat. So what I wanted to do was first lay out kind of a timeline of how we got here. So this process really begins in August with the presentation of the National Citizen Survey data, which really starts the conversation about areas that the city government as itself might improve. Um, from there, we transition into September, where we have the first of two public workshops. The first one was held here in the Stryker Center. And for the first time that we're aware of, we held one on the campus of William & Mary to try and solicit more input. Um, from there, we moved into the, um, pre the review of that information at the uh, work session in September. And then in October, we had the council retreat where we formulated the input from the staff and from the public into some cohesive thoughts in different categories for the GIOs. And now today, we're doing the proposed GIO presentation. And then, uh, obviously, on Thursday, we hope the city council will adopt the final list. And from there, we have the State of the City at the end of the month, uh, where we kind of present the results of this process. So this is the vision statement. And as I pointed out the last time we, we talked about GIOs at the meeting, uh, we, didn't, we have not changed this substantially since it was drafted. We did add last year, uh, or in the last biennium, the two words, and innovating. Uh, but other than that, the vision statement has remained the same. Williamsburg will become an ever more safe, beautiful, livable city of historic and academic renown, served by a city government, cohesively led, financially strong, always improving, and innovating, in full partnership with the people who live, work, and visit here. And from there, we move into the actual goals and the uh, initiatives that are in those categories. Now, there's really no way around presenting this information as giant slides of never-ending text, so I'm going to do my best to move through them quickly. So for goal one, community character, we had five uh, initiatives. Now, as you remember, when we launched our effort this year, we told you that we wanted to concertedly try and reduce the number of initiatives and have them be very actionable items. So what you'll see is as we move through each one of these goals, there are fewer of them in each category, but the text that goes along with them is much more descriptive in terms of the steps that we, the staff, the city council, or the community are going to take over the next two years. So in goal one, we have uh, completing the short-term rental regulations, reviewing the ARB regulations, uh, establishing a neighborhood balance committee, which will look at all issues associated with the balance of uses in a neighborhood, downtown vibrancy implementation, and gateway signage. So these were considered to be the five critical issues of community character. And again, these were based on all of that public input as well as staff input and then consultation with city council. 
So goal two is economic vitality. Um, and our, our first broad topic is tourism product and business recruitment. The second is increasing the placemaking product. Over the last few years, we've been talking a lot about vibrancy and how vibrancy has an impact on placemaking. Um, super regional bike trail development, so our connection to the Cap to Cap Trail or the Birthplace of America Trail. And then regional efforts generally in terms of maintenance of effort funding, our participation in the Tourism Council, and then uh, broadband development. Uh, the city does not have a tremendous impact on broadband development, um, but we want to be aware of what's out there, and this particular one deals with planning for the future. And then goal six, uh, or initiative number six under goal two, is to increase tourism product, and so essentially that deals with uh, completing the implementation of the Tourism Development Fund. Under goal three, which is transportation, this is the largest of the goals in terms of the number of initiatives that we have. The first one is the Strawberry Plains multi-use trail. This is an item that's carried over from the last biennium, and it has to do with studying the proper implementation of a trail that would connect the Strawberry Plains area to both Jamestown Road and um, Ironbound Road. So, Mass transit frequency, we talked a lot about the frequency of WADA surface in and around Williamsburg and wanted to talk more um, substantively with WADA about what they needed to do to increase frequency so that we could have better service. Bike share program, we've talked about for several years and we need to take the next step in deciding how to implement that. Airport commission membership is something that the council has been focused on for quite some time, and so we'd like to advance that topic. And then pedestrian runner friendly improvements. This is a topic where we're partnering with uh, other groups inside Williamsburg to try and achieve an official designation. So then our sixth one is the Capital Landing Road corridor and deciding what our next steps are there. Obviously that's a CIP project that's existing and we need to decide what our next uh, courses of action are going to be. We discussed that considerably at the retreat. Uh, historic area street maintenance, as we know, that agreement is, is up for renewal, and we've heard from Colonial Williamsburg that they'd like the city to consider moving forward with its own street maintenance in the future. We need to really think hard and long about what that means for us. Uh, and then historic district parking improvements along the same lines. If you've parked in Colonial Williamsburg recently, you've experienced the state of the parking lots, uh, we'd really like for that to be a little bit more cohesive, even though they're privately owned and run by the foundation, so that there is a similarity in and the standard of maintenance between ours and theirs. Road project completion, obviously there's a number of road projects underway that we'd like to see get completed. And then the Monticello multi-use trail and streetscape. Goal number four is public safety. And we have uh, an update of the emergency operations plan, uh, looking intensely at mobile integrated healthcare, which is an initiative that we already have underway that we need to look more closely at future staffing and financial commitments. Obviously, that's a successful program that we'd like to see continue. The CERT program and Neighborhood Watch, uh, another similar topic where we need to talk about the future of that program, who's managing it and how, and what funds are behind it. And then enhancing National Night Out. We had a, a discussion at the retreat about the fact that National Night Out is, is a very successful program, but there are areas of opportunity for growth there. Obviously, that might have an impact on our budgetary commitments, so uh, this is an item encouraging us to look at how that might be accomplished. Goal number five, human services, health, and education. Um, in this category, the first one is housing authority sustainability. As we know, uh, our housing authority is blended with city in terms of its resources and uh, operations, and we're pushing that further and further into the organization. We need to come up with a better plan for how we're going to uh, create sustainability in that shared model, and that means looking at the budget long and hard over the next two years to make sure that we're building in the money that's required for not only staffing but also operational expenses. Cedar Grove Cemetery expansion, that's an item that's been carried over for years now. Uh, we need to revisit that again with the college and determine whether or not there's appropriate place for that and whether or not they're willing to participate. Workforce and affordable housing is something that the region is focused on. Obviously, uh, we're coming to this just a little bit late, so this item deals with forming a, a work group, uh, much in the vein like we did with food trucks to identify solutions that might be out there that the city could take. 
uh, homelessness prevention, a similar kind of concept of a work group to look at what homelessness is in Williamsburg and how we might address it positively. And then the One Stop Workforce Center, um, trying to look at how we can recover the loss of the service that was here when we had a One Stop. Moving on, number six, summer youth program expansion. Uh, taking a successful summer youth program and expanding it to be more comprehensive in terms of year-round support for that uh, age group. A senior task force, uh, so this is again looking at putting together a committee that could look at all issues having to deal with senior health, particularly as it relates to obstacles for aging in place inside the city. Um, so we would be looking to partner with the Williamsburg Health Foundation, who's done a lot of work that work already, to identify what steps we might take to further that goal. And then the care team. Obviously, this has been a very successful program in human services uh, that was funded by the Williamsburg Health Foundation. Uh, we've been very fortunate to receive that grant again, but at some point that funding may run out, and we need to be prepared for continuing this important program beyond the lifespan of that grant. Number six, recreation and culture. Um, the first is a Parks Recreation ADA transition plan. So today on the agenda, we're going to hear uh, at least where we are right now in the uh, strategic planning effort for Parks Recreation. And a lot of that work has to do with implementing ADA recommendations. Um, so we need to take a, a hard look at how we're going to implement that and the costs associated with it. A fourth softball field at the Kiwanis Park, Quarter Path Recreation Center expansion, Indoor Field House and Williamsburg Regional Library Renovation are all topics under recreation and culture. And these are all things that we've talked about for some time. These are all issues that continue to progress and will now be a focus of this goal during the next two years. And number six, lawn sports. Um, one of the things that you're going to hear today in the presentation is a need for a lawn type area to facilitate more than just one type of sport. Obviously, the one that we heard the most about during the uh, strategic planning effort was lawn bowling, and that will be a focus, but there are other lawn sports that we need to accommodate as well. Goal number seven, environmental sustainability. Uh, the first is recycling program. As we know, the recycling efforts, not just in Williamsburg, but in the region are struggling because global demand is down for that product. And so we need to be energized as we look at how we can do recycling maybe in a different way. Are there different consumers that we could sell that product to? Uh, renewable energy, same kind of uh, thought process, being prepared for the future. Stormwater erosion funding. As we look around the city, there are areas that are experiencing significant stormwater erosion, and we have no real dedicated source of funding, even in the CIP, to have a meaningful effect there because those projects can be quite expensive. Um, and then Go Green initiatives. One of the topics that we discussed at the retreat was the city has been very successful with Go Green, and we have currently achieved the highest possible rating. Uh, we expect that we will continue to achieve that. But are there are things on the list that we're not doing that we could, could look at further. And so that's what number four is. Goal number eight is the citizen engagement and city governance uh, goal. And under this one, we had a, a number of new initiatives. The first one is a strategic communications plan. So looking at the data that we recovered from our GIO session, but also the National Citizen Survey, how can we better reach the citizens, but also how can we better communicate internally? Uh, obviously, we recognize that there's needs there, and this is a constantly changing field, and so we need to stay on top of it. A photo history of the city. This is an item that was in last uh, GIOs uh, as a topic, and this year we put a little more substance to it in terms of what it is we're trying to accomplish. And so we'd be looking for some help there to create a photo history of the city that could be a new exhibit here in the Stryker Center. Strategic planning renewal. As we've gone through the GIO process this period, we've identified a significant need in terms of renewing the effort, particularly as it relates to the establishment of the vision and the ancillary goals to achieve that vision. And so what we've talked about is the importance of every so often going back and making sure the vision is something that we're trying to achieve and not something we have already achieved. Uh, so that will be a focus as we move forward. Volunteer recognition program, obviously the city utilizes volunteers at every turn, and we need to come up with a process of better recognizing those efforts. And then a benefits review. Uh, in order to remain competitive, we did a pay in class study, we implemented the findings of that study, but it did not include a benefits review, and so now it's time to take a look at that aspect of our compensation package. 
Number six under the uh, goal number eight is a sister city program. Uh, we have not participated in sister cities in a traditional fashion. And so we're going to take a look at that and determine whether or not it has value. And if it does, what sister cities might be out there would be a good match for us. Uh, quest, quest renewal. So if you don't know what that is, that is our uh, new employee orientation program. And it's time for that to get a look under the hood as well. It's time for a refresher there. Make sure we're tying it back to this all-important strategic planning exercise so that we can give a common purpose to every employee in the organization. And then lastly, performance measurement. Obviously, we would not be doing our job if we weren't consistently reviewing what we're doing now for effectiveness. And it's time to do that with performance measurement to make sure that what we're doing, what we're asking the department heads to do to report out performance is meaningful not only to the community and the city council, but also to them so that we're uh, tracking better with accomplishing the goals. We talked a lot about establishing some new categories designed at breaking out those initiatives that were not in a two-year future, but might be in a three to four or a five-year future. And so we came up with two other categories of initiatives. The first is initiatives requiring further development. So if you think about sports analogies, these are batters that are on deck, but they're not ready to hit. And so we have seven of those. The first is looking at town gown best practices. The second is regional tourism development, neighborhood traffic calming, bike lane trail improvements, bicycle safety, housing authority redevelopment strategies, and Queen Mary's Port Park. So these are all topics that are important but need more research before we can create a, an initiative that's easily measurable and implemented in a two-year cycle. And then the next category is horizon planning. So these are topics that we know are out there. They're important to the community. They're important to us as a staff and as a city council. But they are further out than maybe even five years. Uh, or they are things that the city has very little impact on but needs to be planning for. So the first is divesting city-owned property. Obviously, that's a long-term strategy. Uh, underground wiring, as we've completed projects, we've run out of the low-hanging fruit, and now it's time to think more strategically about the biggest impact for the uh, significant cost of that. Economic diversification, crap capital trail connection to Williamsburg, technology and being prepared for those broadband initiatives that we need to take advantage of, old country road development, traffic and streetlight uh, technology, Amtrak ridership, Lafayette and Richmond Road intersection, and education funding. And then number 11 is Paper Mill Creek Park, 12 is Aquatic Center, 13 is Capital Landing Park, and 14, finishing out horizon planning, is identifying additional volunteer opportunities within city government. Can I interrupt you for just sure. one moment? Back on the prior slide, number Allow six. Me to take a breath. Old Country Road Development. I just want to make sure everybody may not have benefited the text underneath that. Sure. That is not to encourage development along Country Road, but right. to develop Country Road into a trail for public use. Exactly. Just wanted to clarify. Right. I'm glad you pointed that out. So as I said, one of the things that we tried to do is reduce the number of overall initiatives. This slide shows you the number of initiatives that we had under each goal in the 2016-2018 biennium, which is still underway. We will do a final report on that in January so that you can see what, we, what progress we made. We had a total of 124 initiatives. And now, moving into the 2019-2020 biennium, we have reduced that down. Just thinking about those two-year strategic priorities, uh, from 124 to 51. So while this is a, a, a much shorter list, I think that it's, it's more actionable, and I think at the end of it, we're going to feel like we have accomplished more than we did with the 124. So food for thought, where do we go from here? Um, obviously what we want is the city council's input on things that need to be tweaked, maybe we're left out, things that should be deleted. Um, if there's a new title that we need to consider, we can. Um, the, the thought being that we would then take this forward to Thursday asking for an adoption of these initiatives. They will then be reformatted into something much more attractive and presented to the, presentable to the public. This is an example that we showed you, uh, I think, a couple of months ago of the direction we'd like to go. This is an Albemarle County example of a strategic planning document that they used as a report to the public. It's a little too cartoony for us, I think, so somewhere between this and a technical document like what we've had for years is what we've been striving for. So if this 
document gets adopted on Thursday, this will be our next step is identifying um, a, a, a good person to help us get to this format. And that concludes the presentation. Questions, comments? Well, uh, question, can you just talk a little bit about those items that, that are in between the 124 and the 51 and how we kind of came to that conclusion that some of those should fall off? Sure. Um, what we did this year that was different, and we're going to, I think our plan is to continue this uh, as we do the report in January, is we took the uh, document that has long been 30, 60 pages long of red text explaining steps taken and we boiled that down into a report card very similar to what we do with the dashboards on our website so that it was a spreadsheet that showed you did we complete it or did we not and then we went through as a group at the retreat and talked about every single one of those 124 initiatives and what we did was we decided if it wasn't done or uh, was going to be done did it need to be now moved on to this new bienniums list and in most cases, what we decided was either the target was not reachable in a two-year span or the outcome was not measurable in that two-year span or it was no longer a priority of the city council. And so ultimately, that led to the reduction. And we also, at the same time, took the list that we generated from the two public meetings and we consolidated down as much as we could into like headings as opposed to trying to capture every single one in explicit text in the list of GIOs. And so I think in the end, we ended up with a list of uh, targets that are much more meaningful and achievable. And, and to that, I, I agree. I think, you know, having gone through this uh, several times now, uh, what we have here in, in this document is, uh, as you say, it's something that, that staff can really dig into and, and, and develop programs to um, to meet these goals and council can uh, easily kind of follow the progress. Uh, you know, those things that, um, that we did cut out are those intangibles almost, um, that there was really no, no solution. They were just kind of ongoing general things that the city does. And so having done this, I think, also provides, in condensing it, provides a better opportunity for the, the citizens who may not have the awareness that, that we as council members or planning commissioners or other people that, that volunteer on boards and commissions would have um, with these goals. And so I think it's, it's, it's very easy to understand and, see, and, and to see that there's lots of stuff happening um, and that we're doing a lot of things to kind of make the city a better place. And so I, I appreciate the condensed version. So thank you. Drew, I want to thank you and staff for all their time and effort towards making this possible at this point and then for adoption, consideration of adoption on Thursday. I have a really quick question. In terms of implementation, you know, past adoption phase, uh, possibly for me, but also for folks who are tuning in and may be unfamiliar with our GIO's process, how does staff go about with implementing? Is it that for all the projects on goal one are accomplished first before moving down the line, or how does it work? No, obviously, if you look at the list of goals and then the list of initiatives under each one, some are much more actionable right now than others. Like uh, staff, right. right. So, you know, the ones that require lengthy study will have to be acted on first. So there are a couple that require us to put together a work group. And so we will start on those right away after January 1st. Identifying good people to serve in those capacities. If it's a staff committee, we'll start putting the staff team together. If it's a committee that requires appointments by the city council, we'll be bringing that back very quickly so that we can get started. Um, there's a couple of items that require looking at best practices across the state, even nationally. And so those are things that we'd get started pretty quickly. Um, one of the things that we talked about as a staff team as we did this was, if you stick with the sporting analogies, you know, the last biennium there was a lot of project work, a lot of spend this money and accomplish this new physical asset. And this one is much more research and development preparing for another kind of capital intensive year or at least program intensive year. So one way to look at this is this is kind of a rebu rebuilding biennium where we're going out researching and bringing back new initiatives that we can tackle in the next biennium. And obviously I'm seeing a lot of these projects though obviously come before council in some sort of capacity or go through our boards and commissions but for the ones that staff merely needs to be actionable about uh, for folks who are interested in seeing the progress of that, um, our budget publishes and includes the GIOs 
um, right. and it tracks the process of certain projects. So if folks are interested about that, you should look into our budget. That's right. We, we, um, Thank you. we include that every year. We also are looking at how we're providing the dashboard data on the website. Uh, we're looking at the vendor that does that for us. Um, and so what we're thinking about is how do we take that spreadsheet that showed that information in kind of a very concise and clear way on progress and transport that as something that could be displayed on the website as well. So uh, we're, we're going to look at other ways to give people insight into how we're moving in progress. All right. Well, thank you. And I would just like to echo upon what uh, Benny said as far as letting uh, the public know how we're proceeding because if once it's included into the budget document, it becomes very, very long. And so I think ways of making it a little more concise and easier to recognize success would be helpful. And the only thing I wanted to mention under, I guess it's longer horizon, horizon planning number 12, um, as far as an aquatic center and partnering with the College of William & Mary, I think it would be helpful to sort of broaden um, opportunities for partnering with William & Mary because I know that they're having a survey right now and looking at things that they might do with Kaplan Arena and so that might uh, provide some opportunities for, for partnering there. And uh, I think we all want to have uh, opportunities for sports tourism and for local uh, events as well. Thank you. No questions? I could make one suggestion, it would be on the prior page on horizon planning that we put that word trail into country road trail development, <laughs> if, if you don't mind. Um, in years past, when we would adopt these exhaustive lists, they were still good lists, but they were more ambitious than they were realistic in our ability to accomplish in two years because we had all these great ideas of things we wanted to do. And what that resulted in was a list that you could look at and go, wow, if we could just do half of these things, we'd be in great shape. And, and that creates a problem because there were some items on those lists that were a little harder to tackle than others. And so they tended to get pushed to the bottom of the list while the ones that were easier to do would rise to the top. And that's why we would get some of these issues that we never seem to quite make as much progress on as we would like. So by focusing the attention more directly on a smaller number of efforts, I think it makes a lot of sense to give staff clarity as to what the real priorities of council and the community. And we talk about council. This isn't our list. This is the community's list. It's based upon the input we receive from the citizens, and it represents where we want to take Williamsburg or help it get to over the next two years, which now is quickly turning down into a year and a half. So don't feel any pressure there. <laughs> uh, we, council will be voting at our <coughs> Thursday meeting on adoption of this. So if anybody has input, we still have a couple of days. Uh, we, it won't be final until after we take that vote on Thursday. Anything else anybody would like to add? Thank you, Mr. Trivet. Thank you. Thank you. This takes us to our next background presentation and discussion. Consideration and direction concerning the 2019 legislative agenda draft. Back to you, Mr. Trivet. All right. Let's see if I can do this one as quickly. All right. So we've already talked a little bit about legislative agenda and where we're going to go. So today I wanted to highlight some of the topics that we are proposing for inclusion in the legislative agenda. And at first I wanted to apologize because I just noticed that this slide is actually an old slide that I updated in a previous uh, presentation. So you'll see there it's got the Williamsburg Area Destination Marketing Committee, which no longer exists. Um, so I have updated this and we'll get it changed on the website after today's meeting. So the organization of our legislative agenda includes four categories. The first is the intent statement, so what's the purpose of this document, and then the second are the priority issues, those topics that have the most importance to us as a city and the ones where we'll spend most of our time during the legislative session. Other issues of focus, of course, are equally important, uh, but they're not something that we may act on during the session. And then the fourth are those issues that are supported by partner agencies that are not included in our list, but we voted on or participated in through our membership with them. 
So the first item on our priority issues list is the communication sales and use tax. We've talked about this before. This is a topic that you can find in most of the legislative agendas in the region right now. And it has to do with equalizing both the tax rate with the sales tax and also expanding the application of this tax to include the newer trend in, in terms of communications. So streaming services and prepaid cards. This is a topic that's actually come up a couple of times in the legislative session and not been acted upon. I can't give you a, a percentage of success this year either. I do think that it's gaining steam, and as that occurs, I think it'll get more and more attention. Before you go on, can you just talk a little bit about what equalization of tax rate and sales tax means? Yeah, so right now the tax rate for communications uh, sales and use is lower than the statewide sales tax. And so the legislative agendas are asking for it to be expanded to include these new uses, but also be raised to match the statewide sales tax. Next is the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel expansion project. As you know, we have already voted and are participating in that through our uh, TPO membership. Um, the question, though, that has come up is, as we've looked at the project, it's become clear that there are some deferred maintenance costs associated with the pilings that support the bridges approaching the tunnel that also need to be repaired or replaced during the construction work. Obviously, we don't have to come back and start this construction effort again. The statutory authority for our uh, local money that does this funding, the HR TAC funding, is limited to new construction projects, statutorily. And so there is debate now between our TPO, HRPDC, and VDOT about is this uh, bridge piling um, maintenance or is it part of this new project? And so we're asking the state to weigh in on that, obviously on the side of the TPO, and dedicate additional VDOT funding to that very expensive project already to recover this deferred maintenance cost. And just to be clear, the TPO and the PDC are on the same page and the same side of that Absolutely. argument that VDOT is responsible for the maintenance of state transportation facilities and not localities. Exactly. And, and we don't want to imply that VDOT has not done any maintenance. They certainly have. If you've driven that route any time, you can see them working on those pilings frequently. Um, but there are still substantial costs that need to be caught up. Next item is one that was added since our last review of the legislative agenda. And it was brought up at the um, school liaison meeting. Uh, that both Mr. Pons and Ms. Ramsey attend. And th the idea here is one that is actually, I talked to Ms. Souter earlier today, and she said that it's one that will likely be on the legislative agenda for the Association of Registrars. Uh, in fact, it will be their priority topic. And that is changing the June primary from the second Tuesday to the third Tuesday of June, which would allow for most school systems to avoid the intense impact of having an election inside their building while it's occupied by students. Uh, so obviously this is something that would help us with safety, but also operational impact. Next is our regional support for the Unmanned Systems Project. Uh, you all know and are aware that we applied jointly th uh, through a regional effort for Go Virginia funding for this project. And now it's time to advance to the next step. We recently considered the formation of the RIFA, which will enable the project to proceed. And now what we need is for the state to grant us the surplus land in York County for this project to continue to move forward. And so there's an item on the agenda urging the state to do just that. Next is an, another new one that was added since our last review. James City County produced their legislative agenda and shared with me a draft. And it re reminded me of a topic that we have been dealing with uh, in both the county and the city over the last two years. And that is issues regarding development protection. So what we're asking for the state to do is to give us clear authority in the state statute to adjust bonding requirements and our review and requirement to approve new subdivision plats for a developer who has performed poorly on a, pat on a previous uncompleted application. So if a developer had come in and applied for a subdivision uh, approval, had gotten that approval, and it had attached to it requirements for performance, such as erosion control or, or what have you, and did not perform for whatever reason, then we would have the ability on a subsequent approval 
to require a different type of bond that's more actionable, a different type of collateral perhaps, but more importantly to me, the ability to withhold or not act on a new approval until those old issues are resolved. And so we'd be asking for statutory authority to take that action. And then the last item under the priority issues is a standard that we have every year and it has to do with local government revenues. There is a whole host of local government revenues that are impacted by the rates that are set established by the state government. And so every year we have an item asking for restored funding where those lines have been reduced and certainly for them not to be further restricted. Also, other issues of focus, obviously we have uh, in categories of good governance, transportation and state and local partnerships. Uh, just a couple to highlight are redistricting. Obviously that's something that's important to us. We want to make sure that our voters are getting a fair shake in the districting. Uh, Interstate 64 projects continue to be a priority. We know that there's a section of Interstate 64 that's not in a TPO that needs attention from the state in terms of funding for completion of that widening effort. And then of course the issues that are brought to us by our strategic partners like William and Mary. And then uh, lastly are our partner agency support items. So this year we've expanded this list. It's typically just VML, the TPO, and the PDC. And last year we decided to join Virginia First Cities. They produced their own list of legislative priorities that we vote and approve. Uh, in fact, that meeting will be here in Williamsburg at the end of this month. Um, and so we've added them to the list of agencies that we support. So where do we go from here? Obviously this process began some time ago in September. Um, I'm going to go ahead and advance to where we are now. So in November we present to you this draft and then hopefully on Thursday you will adopt the draft. If there are any corrections or changes, things you'd like me to move from one category to the next, uh, now is the time for us to talk about that. And then in December we'll have our legislative event, which is typically a meeting here in the Stryker Center with our legislative representatives. Last year we did this on the same night as the Christmas tree lighting, and it seemed to work really well in terms of everyone's calendar because everyone was downtown for the lighting, so they just came here afterward, and we had this pretty quick meeting on the legislative priorities of the city. Um, so that's something that we consider we could consider again this year. Is there a date set for that? I don't know that there is. We'd look at it and see. I know that last year we provided eggnog and it was a big hit, so we'll probably look at that again. Um, <laughs> Not spiked. <laughs> right. In, in January we have the session beginning and then in February the session will conclude. Last time uh, Councilman Zhang asked me if the session was 30 days or 45 days and I said it was 30. He thinks it's 45. We're both right. Um, the reason we're both right is because <laughs> statutorily the session is 30 days in short session. <laughs> but almost always it is extended by the members of the assembly to 45. So a point to both the X's and the O's. Nobody wants to end a good party. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. And if there are any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Um, so I, one of the things that I think we ought to add to this is in terms of partner agency support is uh, over the years we've, we've always, and not always, but um, we've asked consideration of Virginia Tourism Corporation to increase funding there. Um, <coughs> You know, we were fortunate enough to have increased funding for tourism here in Williamsburg, but I think uh, getting additional support to the VTC not only helps the state, but it helps us. And uh, so I think we ought to include in our agenda that we ask the state to increase funding to the Virginia Tourism Corporation. All right. I think that's an item that we could add under the partner agency issues. Last year, our document included a, the gas tax item from the VML agenda. So this year, we could probably extract that. I believe it, it might even be in the VML agenda. So we can do that again. And I, and I support uh, what Vice Mayor Ponce had said. And in fact, the patron that created the VTC is one of their area legislators. So he will be there, and I'm sure he will enjoy uh, seeing that item. I don't know. Um, but I have no further questions. Thank you for your work on this. I don't have any questions. Thank you. No questions. Yeah, and the, the tough thing is um, it's one thing to ask for additional authority or a change to a charter or something that creates latitude where it's necessary and serves the public good. Whenever we ask for money, the, the, the stare tends to get a little bit blank, and the question is, well, where is that going to come from? And, um, but it, it's still worth uh, advocating well, for it. <clears throat> returns, what, 
seven dollars for every dollar invested and so it's an investment yeah. totally agree thank you mr trivet anything else anybody wants to add? okay so we will also be voting on our legislative agenda at the thursday meeting so um again anybody who has input between now and then please feel free to be in touch the next background presentation and discussion is discussion and direction to staff concerning holiday rates for the Prince George parking garage. Mr. Trivet. Yes, I'm going to ask uh, Robert to come up and introduce Mr. Thatcher, who is the consultant on the project, who's going to give our presentation. What? Oh, oh that's a good nope. one. You jumped oh, ahead. I did. I'm sorry. I was moving on. <laughs> we are not that far along that in the far. agenda yet. I was wondering why I was getting a blank stare from Robert. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't even ask him for didn't. money. <laughs> right. I know, right? Exactly. Um, so this is an item that was brought up by a member of city council and I'm going to ask them to talk about it is uh, should we be doing a uh, holiday rate in the Prince George parking garage to incentivize more shoppers in Merchant Square and downtown but also to highlight the use of the garage as an alternative to the other parking lots that might be available or even on street parking that it's harder to find an open space in. And so the staff has looked at it. We've got some information that we can share with you in terms of where we are in our ongoing project to upgrade the parking equipment, um, software and hardware. Also the cost of changing the rate structure. So with that, I'll ask Mr. Maslin to talk a little bit more about what he's got in mind. Uh, thanks, Drew. Yeah, uh, several weeks ago, I suggested uh, to staff that we look at uh, during the holiday season from uh, mid-November to the end of December, allowing two hours of free parking in the parking structure and for four uh, separate reasons. Uh, one would be to free up more of the one hour spaces behind the Goodwin Square parking lot. Uh, two, increase the number of people who try the parking structure for the first time and th thereby become more comfortable using it. And we would look to the merchants to actually spread the word and, until we get all of our wayfinding signs there to show everybody where it is. Uh, number three, uh, support the local merchants and restaurants during the holiday season so that they are on par with their competitors in the region where there are no parking costs. And four, evaluate this approach as a parking countermeasure during construction of Goodwin Square if approved by the city. Uh, just want to add a fifth one. We've been talking to Colonial Williamsburg and we appreciate the free parking that they have on Saturday mornings uh, to support the, the uh, farmer's market. And hopefully uh, if we were to pass the two hours free at our parking structure, they might do something similar in the P6 lot. Questions, comments? Well, so, um, you know, I guess I'd like to hear from staff about, you know, the technology, some of the cost. Um, um, but in, in, with that, I, I do think there's some merit to what Maz, Mr. Maslin has proposed, and so I'd like to kind of hear more before we move. Okay. Yeah, but uh, specific questions for staff? Well, just, um, you know, do we have the technology to allow us to, 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 to change the software to allow for two hours free parking? What's the loss of revenue um, that, that we would be looking at? Uh, I may have some more questions. So I'll, I'll take the technology question first. Um, as you know, we're in the middle of, of replacing the software that runs the Prince George Street Parking Garage. Uh, we are coming very quickly to, the, to that finish line. Uh, certainly the technology exists in the new system. It exists in the old as well in terms of just allowing for, for, uh, for free parking for a certain duration of time. Um, it would certainly benefit us uh, in terms of um, the, the ability to put, because we have to replace all those pay stations, the ability to take those out and put the new ones in with the new system. Um, but in terms of, of just pure technology in there and the management the, using the, the new software or the old software, there's no issues whatsoever with that. And what's the timing for the new software to be implemented? So we're shooting for, for mid-November uh, for the software side of things to be ready. Um, the pay on foot stations where you, if you're in the garage and you walk up and, and to, to pay for your parking in there, that's looking more towards the end of the month. Uh, just because of getting the equipment from the vendor, getting it all programmed and getting it in place. So we're looking anywhere from, from mid-November to, to the end of November to be fully operational. Does that include the, the arm, the apertures that are we replacing that or doing? The arms in the garage go completely away. You drive in, you drive out. Gotcha. Okay. Revenue? 
Yeah, in terms of revenue, looking at two hours, um, the first thing I did is look at how cars cycle in. So the typical uh, average stay is anywhere between two and a half to three hours. So that's a lot of two-hour cycles. I would estimate about $30,000 would be lost between November 15th and, say, the end of December. Um, and that's just looking at the parking revenue and not taking into account any other revenue that could be generated uh, as a result of having the free parking. And remind me, the first half hour is free anyway. So Correct. So we're talking about just an hour and a half. Only if you leave within the first 30 that's minutes. Right. If okay. you stay 31 minutes, you pay for that gotcha. first half hour. Okay. Sorry. No, that's fine. Thank you. That's all the questions I have. I, I agree with uh, the vice mayor. I think there is merit. And thank you, Ted, for bringing up the idea. Um, in terms of the $30,000 in lost revenue, Barbara, um, I'm assuming in the, the vast scope of our budget, it's a very small amount, but how does it impact our operating budget? Budget. Well, I would say that from... What's being taken out, right? What's been... Does it impact in services in any way, and how so? I, I do not foresee that it would impact services. I will say that the average revenue between uh, in that for November and December is about sixty two sixty three thousand so I was a little surprised to see that it would be almost half of that, but again, it's because of the way the vehicles cycle in and the average length of stay and I don't want to get too hung up on the economic loss aspect of it because the idea is that from from what I'm hearing from councilman. Uh, Maslin's that it will encourage more shoppers to want to stay in the area. So, you know, notwithstanding, I just was curious about that aspect if staff had analyzed into that. But in terms of the idea itself, uh, Drew, I was wondering, and you don't have to have an answer today. Maybe if we decide to move forward, we can have it by Thursday. Um, has staff looked into any uh, comparable tourist localities that do this, like two hour free parking, and have they ever had any data on generating return on investment? I have low expectations for this, but I might as well ask. You know. So um, we've not done any specific research, but I can tell you that um, I, I think it's American Express sponsors the Shop Local campaign, and there's the Shop Local Saturday, I think it is, that most downtown associations promote heavily. Uh, and if we look around the state, it will not surprise me to find a number of localities that participate in that by suspending parking f fees um, for that period of time. Uh, maybe not as long as what we're talking about here, but certainly on that shop local Saturday. But the difference with us is we're not participating in that American Express program. Um, final question. Um, has the Foundation or the Merchant Square Association opined on this idea? Have there been discussions on this, or is it possible to get their input by Thursday if we decide to move along? I've, I've been talking to the president of the association, and uh, she supports it. Okay. Yeah, and it, as far as the foundation is concerned, we've not had any formal kind of conversation with them about it, but I can tell you that anecdotally they have said that they're interested in participating in some fashion if we do. Okay. That's all. Thanks. Um, I think it, it, the idea has merit. However, I think we need to look at why people don't park in the garage to begin with. Is it cost primarily, or is it that they don't know where the garage is or how to get to it? or once they get there, where to go once they're in it. So I think we need to look at the signage and signs that are in the garage now, because if you go in there, it doesn't tell you where shops are, where restaurants are, what the proper exit, even how to enter it. And the main concern that I've heard from a lot of people is that it's convenience that they'll drive around into P3, and as long as P3 is there and the garage, I think residents who are the main ones that seem to be concerned about this are will continue to go to P3 first. And so if it's convenience that they'll give up by parking in the garage, are there ways to make it more convenient? Are there ways to maybe look at some sort of loading zone areas close to places where people might want to you know, go into a restaurant to be able to pick up a, a meal or get something quickly or to drop off something. So I think that needs to be considered too. And then I've also heard concern from some people about using the garage and the safety issue. Uh, when you're exiting out of the, I guess, the Prince George exit, 
um, about it being uneven and perhaps the, the bricks there and particularly women walking in high heels. And we are also concerned, you know, about older people and would there even be any merit to uh, looking at adding a railing and what the lighting is. I talked to one of my neighbors the other day and she said, I will not park in the garage at night because I'm concerned about my safety and, uh, and is it lit well enough? Some garages have a certain area allocated for women only to perhaps near the front so it's, it's a little bit safer. So I think that you know, this allows for the opportunity to look at a number of things that might be impacted um, by it. And if we're trying to get employees who might be parking in the Goodwin Square area to park in the garage and open up spaces, what happens after the two hours? Or for people who work downtown and have current leases, will those still be available to them? Or if someone is there for three hours, the first two hours are are free and then they charge for their charge for the third hour, I would assume. Right. And I also have a question and you know, if the cat gets out of the bag and there's free parking for a certain amount of time, but then we go back to charging are people going to be concerned that something that's been given to them has now been taken back, taken away. So to say I think it has merit, but I think there are other reasons than just cost that um, that people don't park in in the garage. Another question, if I may. Um, right now, the merchants can validate parking. Uh, is that some do? I some. think I think what some do is they purchase cards that have a certain value. So uh, I know one restaurant in particular that any client, a customer who asks, they will give them a two-hour parking card that's basically a two-dollar credit. Gotcha. That they, but it's not technically a validation. Gotcha. Um, and there's only a few merchants that do that, but it's available to all of them. Right. Yes. And Mr. Maslin, I wondered if you had any conversations with the president of the uh, Merchant Square Association about validation, because uh, you know, if because if we give parking for free, that just just means the user's not paying. Right. Somebody's still paying. We're, you know, the money's got to come out of our budget. Um, and if the premise is that more shoppers are going to go in, well, then the merchants will be selling more goods, and so. How do we, is there an opportunity to encourage more of the merchants to do some sort of validation uh, for parking? Uh, and, and maybe we sell, you know, two hour cards. I think it was an hour to, what's it, a dollar to an hour to park? That's right. Yeah, so maybe it's, uh, they can buy validation cards at half price. Um, and that engages the, the merchants more in the whole process. And from what I, one last thing, from what I've seen and, and heard, and from my own personal experience, I think that. Tourists sort of expect to park in a garage because that seems to be the norm more when you go someplace. That you know, it, it's not an it's not odd that you're going to pay for parking when you go someplace, and they want some place where they can leave their car for a longer time period. Too. I think particularly when you're not as familiar with an area, you're just happy to be able to find a place where right. you can park. Right. And if it's a, a nice garage structure and you have to pay for it, it's generally accepted territory. What's the bond um, balance on the garage? Uh, right now, it's about $600,000, a little over that. So that's, that's the debt that the city incurred in building that parking structure. That's what remains on it. That's what remains. So, yeah. so what we try to do with the parking fees is we don't make money on charging for parking because it costs us money to administer the garage. But whatever money we do make, we try to apply it to that debt that we eventually have to pay off. To Mr. Pond's point, there is no such thing as free parking. Either the people who are doing the parking are paying for it, or the residents of Williamsburg are paying for people to be able to park downtown. And it just gets distributed over a broader pool. I think the idea has merit. I don't know, I, I, would, I think we have to get a sense of how it's gonna work. I'd rather, personally, as it's my opinion, we take a, a smaller step and consider a one-hour free parking with the hope that we could, if the test program works, and once we have a better handle on what the overall downtown parking is, that we might have a more sustainable model of going long-term to the first hour free. I don't think we can go long-term to the first two hours free because of what it does of freeing up it creates an opportunity for people who just need that parking for an hour or an hour and a half 
on a daily basis, on a Monday, Wednesday, or Friday, or a Tuesday, Thursday, to start using that garage and all of a sudden take over spaces that we need to turn over frequently. And so I'm a little bit more hesitant on the two hour because I don't think we can sustain that for the long term. We might be able to do it for this 45 day period, but then to Ms. Ramsey's point, do we then eliminate that free option going forward or do we cut back to an hour? We don't know what the plan is for P6 yet, correct? We don't know if there's a plan for P6. Right. For P6, right. Right. So, um, I, I mean, I, I'd be fine with trying it for one hour because I think it's, it puts it's a little less exposure on the uh, cost side. And I think we can still get a sense of whether it gets more people into the garage and whether they want to spend more money. But I, li I, I would like that even more if we could piggyback that onto Mr. Pond's idea of some kind of discount uh, validation. Now, it's, it's hard to make a two hour for a dollar work when you already get two hours for a dollar. <laughs> but thinking about how we could get the two things together so the merchants are participating to whatever degree they're interested in it. I was curious, what do you think, Councilman from Maslin? I stick with the two hours. Uh, I think we need to see that that moves people out of the one hour spaces. There's incentive for them. There's incentive for them to stay in a restaurant, not worry about can they get a meal in an hour or not. And we're only talking 45 days, so this is a good way to test everything. And it's a, it's a holiday promotion. There are plenty of stores that have holiday promotions, and people don't expect the promotion to last all year. And I would agree with Mr. Maslin that one hour doesn't really give you enough time to do much, um, even you taking into account the time from walking from the garage to your, to your destination. And if you are going to a restaurant, um, a lot of times it takes an hour just to get your meal. Um, so anyone who would take advantage of it for shopping or for a meal would say, well, I get one hour free, but I'm likely to have to pay for a second hour. So that dollar is going to put me over the edge. Well, does a dollar put people over the edge I'm now? Asking. I mean, they don't use the garage, so I'm guessing there's some reason. Is it cost or is it convenience? Right. Have we looked at additional signage to help direct people to the garage? I know that there's some conversations about people just don't know it's there right. I and mean, how to get to it. So there's nothing on Prince George Street, I don't think. Signage has been a consistent recommendation. Um, it was a recommendation of the parking study itself, and it's a recommendation of the downtown vibrancy plan. It's in your GIOs to look at it. Um, so yes, that's something that we're going to tackle, but we have not jumped into just doing parking signage because it kind of needs to be a, a, a program as opposed to this sign that looks this way and then there's six other signs that look different. Um, so it's, it's a bit more complicated than it seems, but it, it is on the list of things that have to get done. I, I think with, I can lean either way. I see pros and cons with the one hour, two hour. I think for me, what I see in terms of the purpose of this, I see two prongs, you know, what, what may be the return on investment if possibly more shoppers will use and utilize that garage, um, you know, in terms of the broad scope, and that might be hard to measure, and also whether people will just use the garage more. And I would love for staff to find a way to get some measurable data on that to see moving forward if there's a longer term impact, like some had suggested. But um, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I just see the two big purposes out of this um, experiment. I don't know if there's a third or fourth, maybe the case, but. Generally, I, I'm just hoping that staff will also collect, take this time to collect that data as well. That, I think that'd be really valuable. Would it be a true statement that usage in the garage is, is declined since the Goodwin building is not being used as an office? I don't, I don't know. I don't have that data. I don't know if the chief has it either, but uh, it's something we could look into. We have noticed a slight decline in revenue. That could be the explanation. And of course, going into a holiday season, you would expect that there's going to be more parking in the garage because there'll be more people, hopefully, downtown. Right, right. So on this particular item, um, the hope was that we could get some consensus on a direction to staff today. Um, it doesn't require official action of the city council. It's something that we can do internally. Um, but we do need to get a sense of which way you'd like to go. So sounds like there are at least two primary options on the table. It seems like everybody is in favor of some type of promotion for the holidays. It, the question really is, is it two hours or one hour for that 45-day period? So I, I think I, I'd be willing to, to support the two hours for the 45-day period. Um, 
call it a Christmas gift. Um, but I think going forward, I think we, you know, as we implement the new technology, implement the, the parking, the next phase of the parking, um, I'd like to see the merchants who, who ultimately will be the beneficiaries of this um, to, to play a, a bigger role in um, validating cards, you know, or giving their customers First hour free, um, that type of thing. Fair uh, step to, to have them participate. So for those that give validation now, will they give those to the city for, for anyone who comes in and, and parks there? Um, I'm okay with the two hours too, because they say I think that you can <coughs> get a lot done in one hour, but along with that, I think that we do need to look at other aspects on the convenience factor, because I think that that's the uh, a larger detriment for some people as opposed to the cost. Okay. And I think what we ought to look at, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not in favor of the two hours, but obviously I'll defer to my colleagues. Um, what I would like for us to look at is a long-term opportunity for the first hour to be free. I think the 30 minutes, and then if you stay 31 minutes, you pay a dollar, is very confusing to people. Yeah. If we just say the first hour is free and you pay beyond that, I think that will cost us potentially some money, but um, in the long term, I think it's much more user friendly for the community and may help offset some other parking issues in the downtown area. Other comments? Okay. With that. okay. This takes us to our Oh, Mr. Trivet. Yes. Now, now, please. I'm super excited to get to the point where I can ask Robbie to come up and introduce our guest. Good evening, members of City Council. Um, it's my pleasure this afternoon to reintroduce to you Mr. Art Thatcher, principal in charge and consultant from Greenplay. LLC. Uh, this evening he will update you on the Parks and Recreation Master Plan as well as provide you with some next steps. Thank Welcome you, Mr. Thatcher. Hey, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of Council, um, thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to come and update you on the, um, on the progress on the Parks and Recreation Master Plan. Um, Right now, we are kind of in this third phase of the, of the master plan with the draft recommendations. We've gone through our information gathering and our findings and visioning, and now have um, put the master plan together in its draft form, have developed um, recommendations as well as um, actions for, uh, for implementation. And so I'm going to, I, I understand that you've seen the, the PowerPoint, so I'm going to kind of quickly go through a lot of these and, and get um, kind of back to the, to the meat of the, um, of the presentation. So we looked at your, dem at your demographics, um, looked at your sphere of influence, um, knowing that, that many of your participants come from outside of the city of Williamsburg, um, looked at your growth over the next um, 10, 20 years uh, to look at that projection. We looked at your growth based on um, age, and one of the things that, that we really kind of point out is that your 15 to 24s, even though they are the largest percentage of your population, as a percentage they are decreasing. And you can see that your 55 to 85 is, as a percentage of your population, is increasing. So your population is aging as it, as it grows. Um, we looked at some national trends, um, household spending um, totaling $3.9 million within the city of Williamsburg, about $825 per, um, per participant. Again, we looked at your participation um, numbers, a little over 60% are James City County residents with about 18% um, as Williamsburg residents. Again, looked at some national trends in participation, generational trends. Um, we did our public engagement. Um, we held three focus groups, five stakeholder meetings, and a public presentation. Did a random survey, had um, mailed out 3,000 um, surveys, got 441 back, as well as an open link survey to receive another 30, or 302 respondents. Um, these were some of the priorities that we got from the focus groups that we held as focus groups and stakeholder meetings. Um, and then these are kind of some of the, the results from the survey, looked at our demographics, 
um, looked at your residency. You can see that in the invitation sample, 90% of, the, of the, those were from Williamsburg, um, which is where they were mailed. And then in the open link survey, the participation was much greater um, in James City County, which kind of correlates with your participation rates within, um, within your Parks and Recreation Department. We looked at current usages. Um, we looked at current usage by age group. We um, looked at top values, um, affordability, access to parks and programs, um, promoting health, and um, bike friendliness were really were those kind of top priorities from the community. Um, again, looking at those based on age, um, looked at satisfaction um, on a five-point scale, um, five being very satisfied, four being satisfied, and as it comes to your parks, as well as your programs and your facilities, all rating in that um, satisfied range. Um, asked about improvements uh, and um, or importance of existing facilities, open space, community parks being the top, um, how are they meeting the needs, uh, most of the, with the invitation sample, in that four um, being that, that it was meeting the needs of the community. We plotted those to kind of look at the importance and, and the needs metrics. Um, and really, you're doing a really good job. Um, some of those softball, um, youth athletics, as well as your open space, um, have some uh, areas for movement to really kind of get into, into alignment with the other programs that you're offering. Looked at programs, um, additional programs, fitness, wellness, community events. Um, looked at future facilities, increasing the number and connectivity of your trails and pathways, um, connecting to the Virginia Capitol Trail, preserving open space as the, the top priorities from the survey folks. Um, what would increase your utilization, improve communication, lower prices, more programs and community events? Um, how well is your communication? Um, there's some area for, um, for improvement there um, from the invitation sample. And then how would they like to receive your information? This is one that we ask. And you can see that emails from the city really is the, you know, the, the top way that, um, that everybody would like to receive information. But you can see that the local media newspaper is the second preferred for those 55 and over. However, social media is the second preferred for um, those 35 and under. Um, financial options we asked about um, to, to help fund the recommendations and to fund the department. Um, you know, there, um, the new dedicated property tax was, a, was kind of the, the, the least operative. Um, a bond received um, 80, or I'm sorry, 58% um, kind of that would support or probably support um, from your, um, from the invitation sample. So we asked about um, kind of use of the, the tourism development fund, um, and you can see that you know 40% of the invitation and 50% or 54% of the um, the open link definitely would support using that for um, for parks and recreation using the, some of those funds for parks and recreation improvements. Um, and then this was increases would an increase in fees um, hinder your your um, participation. And you can see that in the 70% the on both, 61, 64%, I'm sorry, of the invitation would not really um, limit their participation. So we did an inventory. Um, you know, we looked at the, you know, the, kind of the community context. Um, one of the things that jumped out at us is that a significant amount of your um, land mass is owned by other, other landowners, um, largely Colonial Williamsburg, uh, the National Park Service, and the College of William & Mary you know, make up you know, a, a good portion, over half of your, um, your land mass right now. And so we looked at that as well as um, significant amounts of, of water within the, the area and then your 10 parks that are provided by, um, by your department. So looking at those parks, uh, Waller Mill being the largest, um, you know, your athletic complexes really being, you know, athletic fields only being at Kiwanis and Quarterpath. Um, Quarterpath containing the city's uh, only really indoor recreation multipurpose facility, and then Waller Mill and College Landing providing access to, um, to water. So we looked at a con we looked at each one of your your parks. We did a conditions assessment, um, and that's just provided in the um, as an appendix in the um, in the plan. We ranked each one on a scale of one to three, 
and, um, and kind of looked at really concentrating on those ones for improvement. So your parks are well, are well used. Um, your maintenance is medium to high level. They're clean. They're safe. Um, there is, you do have an aging infrastructure. Um, several of your parks have multiple experiences, play, walking, recreation activities. There's really no cutting edge um, recreation uses within your parks right now, no destination playgrounds or, or any of those things, and, um, and really no multi-purpose um, turf fields or rectangular fields within the system. Um, so we, we map those. You can see this, this looks at your, your map, at your, your parks by access to them. And so within a, a five mile, or a five, sorry, a 10 minute walk, a 15 minute ride, and a 10 minute, and a, and a 10 minute drive to, um, to your facilities, looking at where their access points are um, within the system. And then we also looked at them based on um, where they were and access based on population. And then, again, as the, the land ownership piece, we looked at those and, and mapped um, those same accesses. So as we looked at gaps within the system, you can see that there were kind of three main areas where there, were, where there are really no access to, um, to parks currently. And, um, and so we've made some recommendations about you know, how we can increase access to those and um, where those might you know, be other service providers that, are, that also are providing access to those fields or those, those facilities. So again, kind of looking at some primary recommendations from the, 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 um, the inventory and the level of service analysis, you know, improving your existing pedestrian network, um, analyzing your, your park's current services, how they're being provided, um, adding to your deficiencies where you're, um, where you're lacking in um, ADA compliance, um, looking at branding, signage, and wayfinding. Um, to uh, many of your neighborhood parks are kind of lost and people can't find them. And so, you know, wayfinding being a, you know, a main way to kind of increase your communication as well as increase their ability to find those. Um, individual parks, you know, we looked at, at Waller Mill and adding some additional activity areas, building the fourth softball field at, at Kiwanis Park to increase your ability to host tournaments there, um, expanding your indoor multi-use facility at Quarter Path, adding, the, adding another gym to, to that facility, um, upgrading your stormwater system at Bicentennial, as well as improving the trail system at, at Redoubt Park. Um, and, and looking at some of the drainage concerns. And then possibly looking at creating some master plans around your three larger parks for future development um, within those parks, um, other than conceptually what, what we have done. And so um, one of the things that we asked about was sports tourism and kind of looking at you know, your opportunities for sports tourism and those things that, um, that kind of fall in that realm, so tournaments, you know, non-traditional activities such as your Tough Mudders, your Color Runs, um, your police games, camps, clinics, um, conferences, you know, are all around sports and sports activities, and then special events. Uh, again, marathons, half marathons, those things are typically what we look at as we, as we look at sports tourism. And um, we know that, you know, communities can attract individual participants within a 30-minute drive, as is, um, you know, evidenced by your, um, your participation by individuals in James City County, York County, Williamsburg, as well as Hampton and Newport News. And those that travel 90 minutes or more are more typically going to bring their families um, and stay in a hotel and spend more, more time in your restaurants and your shopping. And so as part of this, we, um, we looked at within a 90-minute drive, um, 75 miles, the number of facilities that the number of um, sports facilities that currently exist within the, within the region. And so at, at what would be kind of competition for, um, for any kind of a, a sports tourism opportunity. And so we've mapped those in, in, the, um, in the master plan. We have a list of those and where they are and what, what's compi comprised in those. Um, you know, some, some opportunities to consider that we considered is, again, adding that second gym at Quarter Path um, to increase your opportunity to host tournaments there. 
um, connecting to the Capitol Trail to really become a, a, a bike tourism destination a, as part of that. Um, considering the development of an aquatic center in partnership with the College of William & Mary. Um, increasing your access to Waller Mill for fishing um, tournaments and fishing activities as well as other water sports, stand-up paddle boarding, kayaking, races, and those, piece, those things. Um, duathlons, biking and, and, and um, paddling. Considering developing a field house um, in conjunction with the College of William & Mary, James City County, and York County um, to host larger scale um, indoor events. Consider the, the development of non-traditional um, facilities, such as outdoor, an outdoor pickleball complex. Um, you have tennis courts that are over at Quarter Path that are really not being used. Uh, would be a good opportunity to, to look at maybe repurposing those to, um, to an outdoor pickleball to be able to do some tournaments and attract. Um, biking, as we talked about, the um, adding to the Capitol Trail to, um, to be becoming more of a biking destination, as well as looking at the opportunity for, um, for lawn sports. Um, looking at reopening the mountain biking trails um, at Waller Mill to, in, to increase your, your tourism and your use of that facility, and then again adding the fourth softball field at, um, at Kiwanis Park. So we took all of, the, all of that data and we began to look at kind of key issues and recurring themes. And so maintaining and improving um, and repairing your existing facilities, um, looking at improving your co connectivity, developing trails and bikeways, um, connecting to the Capitol Trail, increasing your availability of indoor space um, for athletics as well as to support um, developing sports tourism, continuing to develop your partnerships and engaging um, not only the public schools but the College of William & Mary, um, the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation and your regional sphere of influence, um, James City County, York County as well as Hampton and Newport News. Um, preserving open space and, and land acquisition as it, as it becomes available. Um, as, as one of the priorities uh, that came through both the focus group as well as through the survey. Um, improving your communication, your branding and your marketing, um, your need for new facilities, gyms, uh, possibility of a splash pad um, down in this area to attract young families and keep young families here, dog parks and outdoor fitness equipment. Um, at, at, some, at your parks, um, quarter path being one of those areas. Um, as well as increasing programming in the areas of fitness and wellness, and then adding funding, adding to your needing additional funding sources through grants, bonds, um, through the use of your tourism development fund. And so we began to, to put our recommendations in it together, kind of looking at focus areas of maintaining, sustaining, and improving. Um, we, we drew from the community input, the survey, national trends, inventory, our level of service analysis, and our findings feedback. And then we, um, we developed an action table with looking at short-term, mid-term, long-term, and then ongoing um, time frames. And so um, I, I've really only, I've only included your goals, the goals and objectives in, in these slides. In the document, there are the full action steps for the implementation of each one of these objectives. And um, I, in the essence of time, I didn't want to go through each one of those action steps. And so, um, but they're, they're in, the, um, in the document itself. And so the, the first goal is to add new and improve to your existing infrastructure and your amenities. And again, you'll see that maintaining and improving your existing facilities, parks, trails, and open space, um, exploring adding um, additional bike paths and walking trails, um, pursuing the connection to the, the Capitol Trail, um, exploring adding open space, improving your natural area preservation, um, looking at adding a splash pad and or a destination playground within the system, especially in the downtown area to, to draw and, and keep people in this area, um, developing a departmental ADA transition plan. Uh, we have, through the, through the inventory, uh, we've developed a list of um, deficiencies for ADA compliance, which is the, uh, the, the stepping off point for, um, for conducting a, an ADA transition plan. Um, developing additional indoor facilities, adding outdoor recreation facilities and amenities, um, looking at exploring those non-traditional recreational opportunities, continuing to pursue opportunities for sports tourism, and exploring the addition of public art um, within, your, um, within your current park system. And so the second goal is continue to improve um, your programs and your service delivery. 
Again, um, going to continue to monitor your participation. The, the department does a really good job of, of keeping participation numbers and, um, and usage of programs. So um, you can make adjustments at, as needed where space is limited. Um, enhancing your special events programming was one of the things that came out of the survey as well as the, the focus groups. Not necessarily the department having to do that, but partnering with other organizations and other groups to, to increase your special events um, programming. Exploring opportunities for fitness and wellness programming. Um, continue to work with your other service providers to um, develop programs and services you know, such as your, um, your, your uh, rectangular sports you do in conjunction with, uh, with James City County. So continuing to um, increase those, those opportunities. Um, continuing to monitor the affordability of your programs um, and you know, what, the, what the costs are versus your, um, your return on your investment. And then um, monitoring your staffing levels. Um, currently, you're, you're an adequate staffing level, but you're really at a maintenance level. Um, so adding to your maintenance staff as well as to your front desk staff at Quarter Path will increase your customer service as well as be able to um, kind of move towards um, doing some improvement projects and not just, on a, not just doing a, a daily maintenance uh, routine with your current staffing levels. And then as you begin to increase programming and facilities, keeping up with that, um, that opportunity. So the third goal is to continue to improve organizational efficiencies. Um, and we've uh, provided uh, marketing and communication, um, the, uh, a plan within the, um, within the master plan to grow your identity and to continue to, to brand the department. Um, enhancing and improving your external communication, um, continuing to, to grow your, your use of social media as well as your other um, activity guides and, and programs. Um, staffing appropriately to meet your current demand and, and maintain existing quality of service. Um, reviewing your joint use agreements and uh, making sure that you are maximizing your potential with those joint use agreements with the, um, with the school systems as well as um, the, the other jurisdictions that you, um, that you partner with. Um, exploring additional partnerships to assist in funding, volunteering, and marketing. Um, upgrading your Wi-Fi service within the park system that was one of the things that kind of came out of the focus groups and the, um, and, and this, and the survey was the looking at Wi-Fi and also the use of um, management software and application software within your parks um, to, to be able to, to find trails and, um, and do some wayfinding within the, within the park system. And then the final was increasing your financial opportunities. So um, exploring additional funding options, um, exploring opportunities to increase your, your sponsorships, pursuing grants and philanthropic opportunities, reviewing your per current program and rental fees. We, we did some of that as part of the process and have made some recommendations of, of where you are in the market and, and how you might be able to, to look at that as well as exploring um, additional capital funding opportunities as, um, as part of the, um, the regular capital improvements plan. And so those are the the recommendations and the kind of the, the information that we've gotten to. Um, as far as next steps, um, so I'd like to get some, some feedback um, and have you have an opportunity to get you to have an opportunity to, to read the full plan, look through it, provide comment. Um, we have a, um, a, a presentation scheduled for the Planning Commission at the end of the month to present the, the draft master plan to them and receive feedback from them. And then the hope would be to come back to you with a, with a final plan incorporating all of that feedback for adoption um, either in December or after the first of the year. So a lot of information, uh, a, lot of, a lot of recommendations. And then I, so I, I guess you know, if you, you take out some of the big projects, building new buildings or adding new stuff, there's a, there seems to be a lot of low-hanging fruit that, that the city can can do to you know increase Wi-Fi and service and, and those types of elements. Um, so I guess probably the next step would be, I mean you're going to kind of dig into this and, and present kind of a strategic plan as to where you think this needs to go. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We. I mean I think um, the plan it really validated some things that that we knew and some of the things that we kind of anticipated. So um, we've been been working with with Art and we're going to dig into it and kind of do. Um, we're going to prioritize to see kind of what we can do immediately and then plan from there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Art. 
Thank you, Mr. Thatcher, for presenting this, and thank you for a very comprehensive uh, study. It's exciting to see this come into completion to a certain extent. Um, in terms of what piqued my eye was um, recommending about annual, annual uh, maintenance plans. Mm -hmm. So is this a, a, a common thing among parks departments across localities? Yes. Across the United States? Is it been a recent phenomenon? Because you know, I, I would think we would have one, but I didn't know this, if it were a, a generally a newer thing. Well, the planning process. Um, what we find is, um, and this it, is different from the CIP, yes, because right? we generally do our uh, improvements yeah. through CIP. Yeah. So, the, so the maintenance plan is, is really a, like a calendar of when you're going to do routine maintenance on your fields, on your facilities, and those things. Uh -huh. And so, what we find in most localities and even here is that they do have a, a, a maintenance plan, and they have a, a, a a plan that of how they're going to do, you know, typically seasonally when they're going to do certain things, but it's not written down. It's not in a in a written format, and so we've provided um, we've provided that as part of the master plan. We we've, we've provided some some guidance on how to prioritize those when when certain issues should be taken care of. You know, when you're going to oversee, when you're going to you know do yeah. those type maintenance issues, and so many of them do it. They just didn't, haven't formalized it, which is, which is really what, and once you get into the master planning process, formalizing those is really kind of what you're looking to do. So by formalizing it, does it make it a lot better for, for what you're saying, strategic planning moving forward? Absolutely. Because you know, I'm thinking about, in terms of not formalizing it, is having a written down annual maintenance plan, but I'm thinking you know, our comprehensive plan is there for five years. To a certain extent, some language is in, is in there to reflect some of the infrastructure and aging needs of our parks, right? Because it's a built environment document. Yes. Uh, we have our two-year GIO, so there's language there. Our CIP is what, five years, 10 years? Sorry, okay. law school. Uh, but there's already some sort of long-ranging planning process. So what you're advocating is just having a separate document and you know, basically just making it purely for parks. Yeah, and, 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 and what we're talking about with the, with the maintenance plan is really kind of your routine maintenance. Yeah as opposed to, to having something that either duplicates your CIP plan or duplicates your strategic plan. Right, and that's plan. what I was trying to get at, not just, you know, obviously I get that there's a different plan with it. I just wanted to make sure we weren't doing something that's redundant. But, yeah. you know, if you had park systems doing this across, you know, the country or across the Commonwealth, I'd, I'd be curious to see what works and what, you know, what was right. sufficient and what wasn't. Um, in terms of the, the Tourism Development Fund with that survey, remind me, because there was just a lot of information that was thrown out at me. Um, those survey responses were the majority of the, what was the breakdown with city residents that had responded as opposed to just anybody? So, um, so on the left hand side, the invitation sample are city residents. And so 73% said that they would definitely support or probably support the use of those funds. On the open link, if you remember kind of the demographic, the majority of those were from, um, from James City County and York County. And so, you know, you're looking at another um, 7, 70, 80% said that they would, they would support that um, as, as non-residents. Right, okay. Gotcha. And, and just final comment, I, I think there's a lot of great things to pull from it and kind of what the Vice Mayor had suggested, there's some low-hanging fruit that we can address immediately and I'll defer that to what staff wants to, to proceed with that. Um, generally, I was looking at the map analysis and I know we have had some citizens in certain areas, I'm thinking Capital Lenny Road, that desire to have a park and it's good to see that some of these areas are you know, being overlapped by the study, kind of adding to that. Uh, bolstering kind of that, that proposition, and I know that's reflected overlapping with our GIOs, and I think that's a good thing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation, and one thing that sort of jumped out at me was how good our Parks and Rec Department is doing things now, because there's a lot of continuing to do and further development. So I think we are in HEPN on the, on the right path in a number of ways. Absolutely. Just sort of curious, when you mentioned the, the document, I guess that's the, the, 
thicker, larger master plan that will be forthcoming, correct? Yes. And so will there be specific strategies and cost estimates for some of these things? Yes, ma'am. So like... Yeah, there's, there's an action table in there with, with each one of these objectives and then action steps that we recommend. And if there are capital um, cost implications, if there are operational cost implications, and then a timetable. Okay. Because some of the things like pursue connecting to the Capitol Trail, some of that is within the city's capability, but much of it is in the county. And so um, as far as getting to the Capitol Trail. And then for Wi-Fi, sort of what the cost would be for some of those things, too, and for additional staffing. So, right. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I was a little surprised, though. I, I didn't see any questions asking our residents uh, to what degree they're using James City County facilities. And we know that, you know, like, the James City County Rec Center has a lot of uh, swimming, uh, fitness center that we don't offer, and we don't have to duplicate that. And it seemed to me that should have been a major part of the, the study. Um, well, I mean, we, we were really just looking at, at Williamsburg. Um, I, I do have the... Um, I talked to the Parks and Rec director in, in James City County, and I know how many members they have that are Williamsburg residents in, in, in the rec center. And um, I, th I believe the data is in the, in the report. If it's not, I can get you that, that number. It, it, it is a, it's a low percentage the of, of residents that are using. The additional challenge with that is James City County, either you, um, they count the city of Williamsburg as part of James City County as their user. So either you are a Williamsburg and James City County resident or you're not. And so the category that's not is, is everyone else. So they, they clump the city of Williamsburg in with their James City County numbers when they track residency for their programs and use of their community center. But when you were sending us the questionnaires or when we were responding, that would have been a good question. Right. We can self-report to what degree we're using it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thatcher. Just a couple of questions. Looking at goal one as an example, with, and you don't have to go to the slide, but you've got the 10 objectives listed under that. Is there any prioritization within that? As I look at um, objective number five, explore adding splash pads and or destination playground, that might be a nice to have. But objective number six is develop a departmental ADA transition plan, which I would think is something that is essential to have. Right. So there, there are time frames for that, that we recommend for implementation within the plan that are short term, one to three years, um, mid term, um, what, four to seven years, and then long term, um, eight to 10 years. And so that, that kind of adds your, that, that offers your priority there. If you would, I, if it would be, I guess, a, a more usable document, um, if we rearrange them so that all of the short-term priorities were, you know, one through four, and the midterms were came next, uh, I I can make those those adjustments if that something that would make it more usable for for you all. Maybe it would be something as simple as highlighting or putting an asterisk or bolding ones that you think are more important to do sooner rather than later, okay. uh, based upon all the information you've collected. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, next steps here, Mr. Trivet. I think the next steps, uh, Mr. Thatcher said, is they were going to present the, the final draft of the report to the Planning Commission. They'll take a similar step here with City Council. Um, staff will continue to work with uh, Mr. Thatcher's company on finalizing those recommendations into actionable items and then we can come back to council at an even later date to present to you kind of our action plan of what we're going to do first and how. And the background information on these goal steps, if a, res a citizen was interested in looking at that to, or a council member, where would we find that? Right now, I think it only exists in the final draft of the plan. And as soon as we have that in a form that we can, we'll post it on the website. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, yeah. sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, that concludes our background presentations and discussion for today. Uh, next on the agenda are City Council communications. Do any council members have anything they'd like to report from their liaison assignments? Sir, I don't. Okay. Schedule meetings for November. Mr. Trivet, anything you'd like to highlight? 
Uh, there will be a flag setting for Veterans Day at Cedar Grove Cemetery at 9 a.m. on November the 8th. Of course, we have our regular council meeting on the 8th at 2 p.m. Uh, Veterans Day is November the 12th, and city offices will be closed. Uh, there's an EDA meeting on the 14th, and then State of the City will be November the 29th. And just in case anybody wasn't aware, tomorrow's Election Day. Please don't forget to vote. I don't know how you could have missed it. If you, <laughs> um, this takes us to open forum. I don't believe we have any speaker's cards, so I'll just open up it. Yeah, Mr. Shelley, anybody who'd like to address council on any matter, uh, please come forward, state your name and address, and if you could keep your comments to five minutes or less, we would appreciate that. Welcome, Mr. Shelley. I am Gary Shelley. I live at 205 Indian Springs Road. I will be speaking again today about the 110 Harrison Avenue project, continuing where I left off last month. There's a lot to talk about, and um, I try to keep these um, with, within five minutes. I intend to bring this issue to a close. But first, the underlying causes of the issue and City Council's lack of transparency in response must be acknowledged frankly. And most importantly, we must learn why this issue is relevant to our city moving forward today and what we can do to correct the forces that brought the issue about in the first place. Last month I spoke of widespread consensus, including a former councilwoman, a Williamsburg Redevelopment and Housing Authority employee, a former RHA director, the RHA board chairperson, and the Virginia Gazette that the project was a failure. In August of 2008, Almost two and a half years after council approval of the project, a news article wrote that present council member Paul Freiling came to reconsider his position of approval and now considers the funding of the Harrison property something not to be repeated. When the public first learned of the transaction in March of 2006, the reaction was swift and unprecedented, particularly on campus. The Flathead had headlined its staff editorial concerning the project, Reckless Disregard. In another article, it, and I quote, sends the blaring message that the city does not welcome students. This is sad. A graduate student wrote, the measure is obviously hostile towards students at the college. The Virginian former headlined, Vice Mayor Holman proposes anti-student housing plan. A freshman referred to the project as dirty politics. Another said the plan has a discriminatory tone against young people. A sophomore called it unfair and short-sighted. A junior called it arbitrary discrimination. In the publication, The William and Mary Progressive, a student claimed that the proposal could have been the single greatest mistake in Williamsburg's history. The public did not let up on the issue. Two years later, in a letter to the Virginia Gazette, a well-respected professional realtor who lives close to the property asked, is this the best investment of taxpayer money? Another homeowner in the neighborhood wrote that he believes that the RHA does an excellent job providing suitable housing opportunities in the city and that the RHA's efforts are vital in sustaining Williamsburg as an inclusive and inviting community, but that it is hard to believe that this rationale holds for the property at 110 Harrison Avenue. Yet another longtime homeowner in the neighborhood said, I think it was wrong of the housing authority to take the property off the market. It is not a fragile neighborhood. It is a very nice neighborhood. A January 2008 Flat Hat staff editorial headlined, Outrageous Rental Plan, claimed the transaction represents our local tax dollars at work in the most irresponsible and unnecessary way. An article in the Virginia Informer was headlined, Williamsburg City Council and the WRHA abuse power. Nor was the project forgotten. In 2012, the Virginia Informer wrote that, and I quote, in that particularly egregious instance, referring to the 110 Harrison project, students in this publication and others correctly identified the 110 Harrison Project as a deliberate attempt to ensure the students would not be able to live there again. There are lessons to be learned from this experience. 
The underlying cause was town gown tensions resulting from William and Mary students living in neighborhoods within walking distance of the college. City Council greatly exacerbated the problem by continually not responding year after year to legitimate citizen concerns. I will have plenty more to say about 110 Harrison Avenue in future meetings. I invite anyone who has comments or contradictions to speak here publicly or contact me directly. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Shelley. If anybody else would like to address council, please come forward. Welcome, Ms. Cook. Good evening. My name is Kira Cook, and I live at 315 Peniman Road. Uh, good evening, Mayor, members of City Council, Mr. Trivett and Ms. Shelton. I'm here this evening to express my interest in serving as the city representative on the Williamsburg James City County School Board for a second term. It has been an incredible honor to represent City Council and the citizens of Williamsburg on the WJCC School Board for the last four years. During my term, I have served as vice chair of the school board for one year and as its chair for two years. And during my tenure on the board, WJCC has successfully hired a wonderful new superintendent, adopted a strategic plan, and opened a new middle school in the city. Together with my colleagues on the school board, I have worked to meet the educational needs of all Williamsburg James City County students. And I would like to continue that work, and I hope you'll allow me that opportunity. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Cook. Would anybody else like to address council? Seeing no one else, we'll close the uh, open forum. We do have uh, an item for closed session. We do. Right. Do you want to do that now? So what's the proper, should we? So if you want. Can I explain what we're doing? Yes. We have the uh, Williamsburg Redevelopment and Housing Authority meeting scheduled after the city council meeting. City council also has a closed session, which might be lengthy. Might not. But rather than make anybody who would like to be here for the Housing and Re Redevelopment Authority meeting wait, we will go into a recess and come and have the Housing Authority meeting. And then after the Housing Authority meeting, council will reconvene in closed session. So, so you need to recess in open session as council. And then we'll come back into open session. Come back into open session after the Housing Authority meets and then go into closed session. So I'd move to go into recess. Second. Ms. Burcham? Aye. 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 So we'll take an initial brief recess to reset for the Housing Authority meeting, and then um, we'll take about five minutes for that.